Hey everybody, welcome to today's Kubernetes Clinic, Top 10 Lessons Learned from Managing Kubernetes. Today's featured speakers are um, Ryan Bensky and Ryan Mirren, both are SREs with Fairwinds. Today's session is going to be in listen-only mode. If you do have a question, please submit it through the Q&A tab in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Ryan and Ryan, over to you. Hey, Dave. Thanks for that. Yeah, Ryan and I are um, engineers here at uh, Fairwinds. Um, helping uh, different clients uh, run their Kubernetes clusters successfully and make sure that they go beyond just running clusters to using Kubernetes as uh, a platform to let your applications run successfully. And as you can see from this mission statement, uh, we're the trust, a trusted partner for Kubernetes management. Um, we build and manage infrastructure that's securable, reliable, and efficient, and um, along with managing and handling uh, pager coverage at the infrastructure level, uh, we let enable our clients to mainly focus more on their business and get uh, a lot more sleep than they might otherwise have. So uh, yeah, so we do this for a bunch of different folks. We work in the main three cloud providers with EK, uh, AWS, GCP, and Azure on AKS, EKS, and GKE. And yeah, we've uh, spent a lot of time with a lot of pods and a lot of clusters and uh, wanted to share some of the things that we've been, uh, that we've learned through that process. Uh, Ryan, want to say anything else? Uh, no, I've got nothing to add to that. That was beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> cool. So I guess we have a polling question to get started. Uh, like Dave said, uh, happy to answer any questions that come into the chat, but I'd like to give you all a minute to look this over, um, kind of see what common challenges you are trying to solve. And we, that can perhaps help us guide, you know, how this, pres uh, this webinar goes. All right, looks like the answers are coming in. We'll give another, um... 15 or so seconds, but so far it looks like um, a 50-50 split where uh, my team is spending too much time provisioning uh, Kubernetes to support developers and um, finding the expertise, lack of in-house skills. Okay. Can you say that first one again, Dave? Sure. Actually, it's a, it's a three-way tie now. So it's 33% um, okay. developers are, are over provisioning workloads. Uh, second one is my team spends too much time providing Kubernetes support to developers. And the last one is finding expertise slash lack of in-house skills. Cool. Cool. I think we actually, some of our, uh, some of the topics here kind of lead to, into that. So I think one of them is, you know, like you said, you know, folks, it's hard to really develop uh, Kubernetes skills, it is very specific. How do you really uh, get teams knowing how these things work, using them, becoming fluent and comfortable, uh, talking about them and using Kubernetes? Um, I think if you go to the first slide, Dave, um, let's see. Yeah, I think that's slide six. Like one of our first topics is actually like, there's so much in the Kubernetes ecosystem. I think it's one of the largest open source projects ever. And there's so many things that go into that. Uh, a lot of that can be overwhelming and it can be very hard to understand what are the things that you should be focusing on as, um, as an engineer building clusters. Um, we, in fact, on our own, along with our clusters that we manage, we'll manage up to maybe 40 different types of ad, 40 different add-ons, meaning things like monitoring software, ingress things, things for certificates uh, for our clients. And so it's not just deciding on how to make clusters work, it's how to make all those things work and in different ways for different types of clients. Um, I think the first thing is to understand, is Kubernetes even right for you? I think there was a great article on that a couple of years ago where it really talked about uh, what's What's the point of it? it? It's a lot of management overhead. Should you be really using that? Um, and for clarity, like I think pretty much all the cloud providers, I know and I've worked in with the one in uh, Google called Cloud Run. I know Amazon has something similar. Actually have really great ways to run 
containerized software or containerized apps at a very basic level quite easily without having to worry about the overhead of Kubernetes. And until you really have a lot of scaling happening and a lot of different microservices that are working together, I'd usually suggest starting with something like that and get your feet wet with running containers, get your feet wet with some of the concepts around that and configurations and get that going. Um, Otherwise, I think instead of looking at all the different tools and all that, really understand how Kube should take the shape of, uh, I think a former colleague of mine once said, Kubernetes should always take the shape of the organization that it's in. So look at exactly what your apps are doing. What are the key things that they want to have? What do you need to focus on? Um, and a lot of times it's probably a lot simpler than you think. There may be a handful of tools out there that can do most of what you need. Um, you know, we've, when we've talked to some clients before starting to work with them, a lot of them will be very new to Kubernetes and start saying like, hey, we want all this stuff. We want service mesh right away and things like that because they've heard these words when doing all, you know, when starting to explore Kubernetes and they might be necessary, but at the beginning, especially they really might not be. And so focus on the very core things that you're trying to do and just get very good at that before starting to add in other things. And I've talked a lot, so, and Ryan will probably agree with me that I've talked a lot, so I'm gonna give him a chance to respond in probably a better way than I can. Um, no, yeah, that's great. I, I have seen a lot of that too. Um, you know, people get excited about some of the newer, um, latest and greatest ways of doing things uh, have actually had come up several times um, needing to provide um, persistent storage uh, within Kubernetes and have been asked uh, to set up a pretty um, involved and complicated projects um, around storage like Rook, Ceph, um, when really keeping it basic, you know, don't you don't need to be, uh, we don't need to be setting up tooling uh, that is well beyond um, where where the organizational needs are. Um, you know, simpler, simpler is better and easier to update, easier to understand and make sure that we can uh, kind of make sure that anybody who needs to interact with it has the skills that they need to interact with it. Yeah, and, and building on that, that made me think of um, another thing we often encourage folks to do is that you can run a lot within Kubernetes, uh, but especially when you're getting started and if you're able to, again, every company has different requirements. If, you, if you're on the cloud and can use uh, cloud providers, other managed services for things like database and whatnot, or message queues and all that, do that as much as possible. You know, uh, let them do the heavy lifting, running stateful things in Kubernetes as possible. But again, it takes more levels of experience to say, not only know how to be a database administrator, but how to do that within a containerized environment. Um, there are cool tools out there. Things like crunchy data are great for that. But again, it's complicated. And if you could use something like RDS or Cloud SQL or whatnot, you know, take advantage of those things. Let them do that work for you. That makes it a lot simpler. Um, furthermore, with other things you might need in the cluster, like monitoring and logging and whatnot, there are a lot of great ways to do that. A lot of different tools, a lot of open source things. Um, something called Open Telemetry has come out recently, which has made that ecosystem even larger and more flexible. But again, when you're getting started, there are some, you know, tools or vendors that can handle a lot of this stuff for you all in one package. You know, we use Datadog for things, things like New Relic, um, Splunk has stuff for that. If they, you know, they can, with usually fairly uh, simple configuration to get started, they can help handle everything from metrics to logging to application performance monitoring to security and all this stuff in kind of one go, which, which again, um, depending on what you're able to do as an organization might just make things a lot simpler. So again, focus, focus on keeping it simple in terms of what you have to do the hands-on work for. And over time, as you get more comfortable with things, you might be able to bring more into your own system. Um, and again, if there's any questions or you want us to build on anything, uh, just put it in the chat and we can come back to that. But uh, yeah, let's move to the next slide, which is a, which is also related to kind of one of those topics that you all um, uh, 
brought up is something you want to hear about. So yeah, how could a smaller team stay on top of everything Kube related? Uh, Ryan, why don't you kick this one off? Um, yeah, there's everybody's uh, writing about Kubernetes these days, it seems. And um, not everybody is a nerd for Kubernetes like we are listening to podcasts about it and everything, which uh, Google Kubernetes podcast. It's pretty great. Um, and I can recommend that as a place to uh, kind of keep up with what's going on in Cube land these days. Um, but uh yeah, I think the number one best place um, that you can stay up uh, with, you know, all the new things that are happening would probably be the project itself. Uh, they have really good change logs and release notes um, as new versions come out, um, which, yeah, they, they do a really good job of uh, documenting well all of the changes and deprecations and all of those uh, critical things that you need to keep up with. Um, how about you, Brian? Yeah, exactly. I think um, there's there's a lot out there, um, but and I think one of the because Kubernetes is very fast moving, the project itself I think releases a new minor version every four months now, so three times a year. Um, and within that, there could be deprecations, uh, so things you have to look at for when doing upgrades. Um, I think the next few of the ones that are, you know, if you were to start today, say on 129, I think 128 to 130 are the three ones that are being supported. Uh, there are really, I think there's maybe one or two API version deprecations that is not used a whole lot that I've seen or I've never even touched. So that much is not as big a deal right now. Uh, but to Ryan's point about seeing release notes, you know, Kubernetes constantly comes out with like, new alpha and beta things. And so seeing what those are uh, can help you understand what's kind of coming in on the roadmap, what things to look at, what things to try out, as well as look at, hey, there's, what does this mean as far as the ecosystem goes? Are there things around like API gateway that look interesting to you? Are there things around ingresses that look interesting? Um, and one issue with Kubernetes is that it is, fast moving like that. And I don't think it has any official like long-term support version. You are starting to see some of the cloud providers do that a bit. So I think AKS is, has an option for long-term support for like a year beyond what it originally had for when it, it stops officially supporting a version. Um, and why this is important is partly around things like CVEs and whatnot. You know, you wanna make sure that things get updated you know, relatively quickly. Uh, but, it, you know, going back to what I said in the previous uh, slide about add-ons, you know, so you have Kubernetes versions changing, then all these different components change all the time too. So we might have Datadog or Argo CD or like um, an autoscaler or a DNS thing. You know, they're, these are often open source projects um, or if they're from vendors too, where we might use Helm charts that change all the time. And so, I think, uh, again, and it took us a while to do this, but we're getting to this point where we are really up, trying to update these as much as possible, um, as frequently as possible. And what that lets us do is make sure the changes are smaller most of the time, maybe a patch or a minor version. But again, getting into a practice of staying on top of the versioning of what you're doing will cause a lot of uh, potential problems, I think, to go away and keep you informed about what's happening. You know, all of these add-on, all of these different add-ons and tools that we use often relate to each other. And so again, by seeing the release notes, seeing what's happening there, you can often get a sense of what's happening in the space and use that as a springboard to potentially start exploring what might be next in your evolution. Um, there is a lot out there, but you don't need to do all of it. And again, just focus on what's there, focus on keeping your app running well, and um, it is really, it's possible to kind of, uh, yeah, keep things going with a fairly small crew of folks who know how Kubernetes is working. Oh, on top of that, I would also say uh, certifications can be, you know, helpful or not helpful, depending on what they are, I think, you know, but I do think getting the, the CKA, the main Kubernetes administrator certificate certification, 
um, it's very hands-on. And so going through training for that, like I think Code Cloud is probably my favorite course by far for that, will really give you a solid understanding of the ins and outs of how Kubernetes works, why it does what it does, and what it's built on top of, and give you a lot of fluency with Kubernetes commands. I, I can't say enough about how helpful that was for me. Um, let's see, you wanna go to the next one, Dave? Cool, Ryan, why don't you do, why don't you start with this one again? Okay, um, yeah, going back uh, to uh, the polling questions, I think um, we were saying a lot of, a lot of us are experiencing issues with over-provisioning workloads um, and that can really easily play into uh into this topic the, with performance issues um yeah it's it happens a lot i think i've i've seen 10 different articles talking about you know companies utilizing 20 to 30 percent of the infrastructure that they have provisioned um and uh yeah it's just benchmarking for that. Um, actually, at Fairwinds, we've written a tool to help with that called Goldilocks that uh, kind of monitors your application's resource usage over time and tries to help you uh, define like reasonable resource requests and limits, um, kind of to hit that sweet spot between reliability and cost efficiency. Um, what else have we got here? I think um, there's many different ways uh, people are working on like scaling nowadays. Um, you know, for part performance is making sure that your applications could scale quickly when load changes. Um, and I think the built-in um, standard ways up until recently have been basic CPU and memory uh, monitoring, scaling based on CPU and memory. But, um, you know, through tools like Keta, uh, we're starting to see ways that you can kind of define your own metrics for scaling. Um, so, you know, if uh, perhaps your app is really CPU and memory efficient, but starts to get bogged down um, by, you know, lots and lots of requests, um, you know, now there's ways to set up scaling based on the number of requests over time. Um, I think you can get down even as far as scaling based on particular endpoints. Uh, so if you're fully distributed application, you can kind of, you know, scale the microservices up that are uh, really the ones that are getting hammered. Um, what about you, Brian? I need a, I need a drink, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, yeah, to that point on developers uh, maybe over provisioning more than they need. Yeah, Goldilocks is a great tool for that. Um, you know, there's some other folks out there too. Um, the one thing you want to keep in mind is that uh, Kubernetes is a very, you know, the promise of the cloud was only pay for what you need. And that's great. You have to figure out what you need, though, in order to know what to pay for. So, um, Using a tool like Goldilocks can help a lot. Um, what it's what it does, and some of these other tools do, is just look over past historic usage, and understand, you know, give you an idea of what your requests and limits should be, you know, at the CPU and memory level. Um, and our insights, I'm not sure if Goldilocks does it, but our insights tool will also include kind of benchmarks for quality of service too. So you may have thing, you know, some job you may have things like jobs that can be, you know, interrupted a bit or certain workloads that, you know, if they do have some issues aren't that critical, or other workloads that are super critical. And through that can give you other benchmarks and suggestions based on those different qualities of service for how your resources should be set. Um, Another thing you can do is say you have developers and they have developer environments or you know using specific namespaces for things. 
Um, once you know what things should be as far as resources go, you can always set up uh, resource quota objects, I think they're called, in order to make sure that people stay within those within their developer environments. So, or you could just say as a starting point, hey, you know, your pods in this namespace can't use more than X amount of memory or CPU. And that can be a way to make sure people don't, um, yeah, start overloading clusters with more than they need. Uh, the last way to kind of do that is through using policy for that. So these are things that help you at kind of the admission controller level or where people are trying to send objects into Kubernetes uh, will let you enable or disable them for sending them, letting, uh, sending them in based on what they have in their uh, configuration. And I think one of the best ones to start with is just making sure everything has requests and limits set on it. So make sure your deployments and daemon sets and all that have requests and limits, because if they don't, this can lead to a big uh, performance issue where if something suddenly start gets a memory leak or whatnot, or suddenly starts using a ton of memory or CPU, um, you know, it can harm nodes uh, that they're running on, which is gonna harm the other apps that are there and cause all sorts of problems for you. And so that's, I think, uh, a really great way to, you know, uh, help some basic enforcement of what can be sent to the cluster or not. Um, I think the last thing I'll say is, you know, a, a lot of times you might see certain, re you know, certain requests taking a long time and trying to pinpoint that stuff. Um, applica application performance monitoring and tracing is really great for that. You know, you can see down to like what database request, uh, you know, what database queries might be causing issues. Or a lot of the ones I've seen are everything in the cluster is fine, but a request that came into the cluster and then one workload has to send something out to another place, another API elsewhere. Um, and that is being slow, can cause a lot of performance problems. So setting up good kind of tracing and telemetry and all that. Um, so you can understand where the bottlenecks might be in the life cycle of a request within your cluster. It can be very, very, very helpful, very quickly to help pinpoint issues with performance. Um, how about the next one? Ah, pinpointing kube application costs. Cool, I think we kind of co uh, covered this quite a bit already uh, based on the performance thing and the question about folks over provisioning. Uh, but again, tools like Goldilocks um, can help you understand from a pod level how much things are, uh, how much memory and CPU your pods are using. And then, you know, there are other tools out there, including our insights tool that can then translate that into actual compute cost based on your cloud provider, you know, based on the instance you're using uh, for your nodes and give you a solid sense of what everything's costing or you know, what a specific workload costs. Um, I think, Ryan, you and I were talking about this. I think you were talking about some of the thing, ways people can kind of separate out workloads to be able to say, hey, this team is using this, is costing this much, vice versa. You want to jump in on yeah. that? Yeah, this has come up pretty much everywhere I've worked. Um, yeah, you have, once you start to rein in the costs on things, uh, I think the natural progression is to find out uh, within the spend who is spending what, and um, that can get crazy um, real quick, depending on on how large your cluster is. Um, so this, I think, probably the easiest and um, one of the most important things you can do here is have a really good um, labeling policy for workloads, namespaces, um everything uh it's separating separating out teams into uh their own namespaces and then even on the workloads having labels for what team is uh responsible for it who deployed it um i've seen i've been asked to put cost center codes onto onto things um it just makes discovering um exactly what's running much, much easier. Um, and then kind of gives you a, uh, gives you some somewhere that you could run 
other tools on um, even just Q control output um, to kind of start to figure out uh, who's using the most resources. Um, it comes in handy for finding uh, phantom deployments, things that are sitting out there eating up resources that haven't been used in months. I think uh, one of the places I was prior to fair ones, I think the oldest deployment I found on a, on a cluster was four years old, um, had been deprecated for three, just, just sitting there eating up resources uh, without anybody, anybody knowing it was there or using it at all. Um, so Yes, I think uh, labeling labeling policies are probably your best bet to get started on this if you're not already doing so. Yeah, and to that point, I think there's a couple, you know, there's a couple other use cases for this. Obviously, one is forecasting, you know, if you're trying to prepare a budget and figure out what you're going to spend for the next year, are you going to get a bunch of reserved instances? And then, um, you know, if so, how many? You know, if you're trying to figure out the most efficient way to calculate your spend for the future, maybe sign, you know, certain spending contracts with cloud providers. Uh, again, this helps you do that and figure out what you should be looking towards. Um, another interesting thing you could do with this is actually say you're on-prem and trying to move to the cloud, or you wanted to see what your workloads might cost on different types of instances. Um, use you know these tools like we have or whatnot can be used for that too you could say hey i know i'm using this much cpu and memory for my workloads uh but i'm running in the data center i can then translate you can you know then translate that into the cloud and say like okay well how much do i think this will cost me going forward if i were to move to say eks or gke um and so that can be very very helpful in researching a cloud migration and researching moving to different types of things and um, making a case whether or not to move to Kubernetes. Uh, so yeah, and it's really hard to do that unless you really know what your resources are and then understanding how that translates into specific compute cost. Um, and again, yeah, there's networking costs too as associated with that. Um, it could be anything from like, you know, all sorts of NAT gateway traffic starting up because of something, and that can change your cost too. So there's a lot there, but I think really starting with your workloads and understanding that and how that relates to your overall cloud spend is really important. Um, let's see. I think we have, yeah, what's the next one there? Better Coop self-service. So this is one that, Ryan, you want to jump on this one? I think this lends itself to um, Kubernetes expertise and uh, yeah, team spending uh, too much time providing Kube support to developers. Right, right. Um, yeah, this is this this will look different to pretty much every organization, depending on where you're at in your in your Kubernetes journey. Um, you know, there's lots of great open source uh, applications that you can run, like uh, Cube Apps is one that basically sets up uh, a UI that's a marketplace of different deployments uh, that people can kind of click through and provision and get running with Ingress, everything set up for them. Um, I think, uh, what was, uh, WordPress is always their... Um, their example, but I've seen people set up uh, database database pods uh, like MySQL pods and Postgres pods and things like that using uh, apps like Cube apps um, to get things up and running without needing to be able to get into Kubernetes at all um, through command line or understand really anything about how it's running behind the scenes. Um, I think, uh, you know, the next level is maybe if we're talking about self-service for developers on your platform, um, I think setting up, having good RBAC policies set up for teams and individuals that might limit them to one, two, three different namespaces, um, kind of cutting off uh, the ability to create or delete certain types of resources just 
so they can't get themselves into trouble. Um, I've had <laughs> I've had a couple of times where uh, I've had you know overly helpful end users trying to uh, troubleshoot with uh, oh you know I've seen you guys restart the pod when things are going poorly and I yeah I did that and uh, come to find out that you know they deleted a deployment or a service or something something that other what they were targeting um so kind of helping people get out of their own way is um is helpful here and then i think there's also you know policy tools um that you can put into place to uh stop people from um deploying like misconfigured from the beginning uh configurations like uh i know a lot of organizations organizations might only want uh deployments running from pulling images from like their own in-house uh container registry um so you could use policy engines um such as Caverno or um we have the ability to set it up through insights to to our tool uh you can limit the uh image repositories that people can pull images from um yeah uh you have anything to add to that brian yeah so you know like like ryan was saying things like policy and whatnot can really help not only as safeguards but as configuration checks um you know you can check you can do configuration checks and repos through ci and you know give people feedback on how they're setting up their applications um, all the way back at that level so that they know early whether or not something needs to be adjusted or not. Um, and those can be super, super helpful. Uh, it also helps save SREs time or DevOps folks time because then you know devs are getting feedback before you have to deal with it once it gets in the cluster. Uh, I will say that, you know, again, like Ryan said earlier, uh, the most successful teams really have good self-service platforms, you know, probably possibly based on some of these tools where a developer doesn't need to know Kubernetes to be effective. Um, granted, there's, you know, there's this certified Kubernetes application developer certificate that someone could get, but that may be more than a lot of folks really need to know right away. Um, uh, but you want something that gives developers, you know, the ability to do things and be flexible without having you need to kind of hold their hand the entire way. And, you know, it's, Kubernetes is, is one of the other, uh, you know, popular responses to the questionnaire was, it's hard enough for SRE or DevOps teams to learn about Kubernetes. Now you want developers to potentially learn how to do that too. Um, I think when it comes down to thinking about certain ways to deploy to Kubernetes, like, you know, you might you've probably heard of Helm or Customize or whatnot, uh, when I've seen things like that be introduced, um, the best ways are the closest analogs to kind of their current deployment methods. So, you know, if a team kind of has certain ways of doing something, then something like customize might be the best fit for that. Um, it really just depends on, yeah, what they know and what, what they're able to do without it being too much friction. Um, so yeah, I think in on the on the post deployment side, um, finding good, easy to use tools for monitoring and such and logging, I think, is very critical. If you have a t if you have a tool that's hard, not only hard to configure but hard to for someone who's not familiar with it to look at quickly, that could be really challenging. Um, again, I. You know, there's some some of these bigger solutions like Datadog or whatnot really have everything there in one single viewpoint. And that makes it easy for people from all sorts of different teams to come together and collaborate. You know, I've seen QA engineers create, you know, uh, what is it, uh, synthetic tests that they can then use to basically automate testing for all sorts of things. Uh, developers can come in and very easily through tracing see what might be working or not working or through um, different profiling tools, understand what specific parts of their code are working or not working. Um, and so all these tools are out there. 
just be very uh, clear uh, and intentional about what you're choosing and how you're configuring it based on who's gonna be using it. Um, and that can really make a huge difference in how, how your teams work. Uh, cool. Oh, this last one's, this is an easy question. No problem. Uh, <laughs> how do you think about security? Ryan, how do you think about security? Oh, usually through nightmares. There you um, go. <laughs> um yeah it's a it's a big one there's so many so many layers uh of this um you know starting through uh application development and then you know building out the container that it runs on um you've got all different all different kinds of uh cbes and things that you need to keep track of and, and think about um so yeah i think a uh, very good start for this um and one I've seen used by many different people across different companies is starting with a, a tool like, well, from from the application level, using something like Sonar Cube just to check simple um, simple things that get overlooked sometimes um, is helpful. And then once you move on to the containerized phase, things like Trivi are really good about um, pulling out comic common CVEs that are easily addressable, um, just trying to keep it patched as well as you can. Um, and then once you're in the cluster, uh, the, I think probably the easiest win um, for setting up security in the cluster is making sure you've got properly configured network policies, um, just to make sure that, you know, the applications are only able to talk to whoever else in the cluster they need to or whatever external endpoints they need to. Um, it's, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, um, you know, you don't really think about. It's kind of off, obfuscated away from you, but, um, just deploying something out into the cluster um, by default. If you don't have anything set up, it can it can access any other workload um, in your cluster. Um, so I think if it's uh, an application that's just an end user application, um, it's pretty simple to set up a network policy that only lets it talk, uh, you know, lets it make contact outside of the cluster, not into any other namespace. And that's you know starting to start just moving towards zero trust um, is probably um, it's the way it's the way to go. Um, what else? What am I missing, Brian? Sorry, I was muted for a second. Um, <laughs> one thing I've noticed for a lot of folks, especially when they move to Kubernetes, especially from potentially some larger companies that aren't necessarily cloud native from the beginning. Um, I think there's a lot of education that needs to happen and not only in terms of what working on the cloud is as opposed to working out of a data center, um, but what containers bring, you know, like, uh, you know, like Ryan said, there's um, container security tools, but also understanding like really what happens when, what has access to what and where, and having people really understand that and think about what tools are gonna make the most sense in that environment. Um, you may have an infrastructure that includes, or you're, you know, all sorts of different things from things running on VMs in one place to maybe running on uh, Elastic Container Service somewhere to different clouds. Um, you may want to standardize things or you want to be more bespoke to figure out what's going to work best in a containerized environment. Um, but yeah, making sure people, you know, who have input here understand what working in containers means and how people could or couldn't access things. Um, to that point, one thing we talk a lot about is with folks is when they're coming to the cloud, what sort of um, operating system or AMI do they want to use for their nodes? Um, there's a lot of newer, they call con like container optimized operating systems that are actually get very, very locked down from the get-go. 
Uh, Bottle Rocket is one from Amazon. I think CoreOS with OpenShift is one. You really can't do anything once the image is built aside from kind of run containers on them without doing a lot of extra work. Uh, and those can be great. As operators, we love that stuff. Uh, however, it also means that there's a lot hidden from you. And so depending on kind of what your own company's policies are, requirements are, what the risk of something happening is, uh, you may want to use that or not use that. Use something like um, a very hardened AMI that you create that has a bunch of your own security tooling and practices on it. Um, so those are things that you kind of have to think about when you're you know, working in this space. Or again, you may say, you know, we use these VMs all over our uh, cloud and we want to keep that consistent. So those are things to think about. Um, how often do you want to update your nodes? You know, usually in Kubernetes, nodes themselves don't tend to reboot themselves. They usually disappear and come back. If you're using Ubuntu, um, we've noticed an issue where Ubuntu auto updates are on. And so every you know, once a day, nodes that are running are going to have packages updated, but uh, that's not going to update anything in the kernel level. There's tools to do that, or you could also just have a practice with some of these to constantly recycle your nodes. If you're using like something like Bottle Rocket, you know, there's tooling around making sure new versions of it, when they come up, very uh, quickly get brought into the clusters. Um, Another thing to really understand to uh, Ryan's point about access is, you know, making sure that different types of users have the right sort of permissions to do what they or don't need to do in the clusters, you know, like getting to a zero trust point. And uh, one of our open source tools called RBAC Manager allows you to have um, groups in the, uh, take RBAC groups and map them to specific roles that are already there in a pretty easy way. Uh, but that's, you know, that's, I think, an important thing to do. Uh, one thing we've done a lot with an EKS lately is they've just released something called access entries before an EKS had a, a config map that would map certain IAM roles to certain groups. And then we would use RBAC manager to map those groups to different roles or cluster roles. Uh, the newer versions of we use Terraform for EKS, the newer versions of that use a newer thing in Amazon EKS called Access Entries, which actually maps, uh, which maps IAM roles to either groups or to specific IAM policies for uh, cluster access, you know, at the Amazon level. And so um, there's a lot of reasons why that config map was really dicey, especially if it got deleted, that was a big problem. This makes that a lot easier to deal with. Uh, but yeah, doing things like just making sure you have, you know, using cloud provider roles and such to map to groups or to specific policies um, is generally a really good practice. So uh, yeah, and the last thing is update often. Back to our point about keeping up on things, making sure things are updated, get those CVEs out of the way, make that a big part of your practice. And, you know, you can then, you know, once you're doing that a lot, figure out ways to how, make sure your update process can be as automated as possible too. Um, it's something we work on a lot here as well to make sure it takes up a, so make sure we can spend our time focusing on other things. Cool. Uh, yeah, and so I think, you know, we're just gonna talk a little bit about how we typically work with our clients, which can uh, lend itself a bit to how, you know, maybe other, platform or SRE teams think about where they sit vis-a-vis uh, -vis their, you know, developers or other folks at their company. So, you know, we right now pretty much just work with um, cloud providers, managed Kubernetes uh, services. So again, AKS, EKS, GKE. Um, we are, when we work with clients, we're usually responsible for setting that up. Um, and again, the control plane and worker nodes and cluster networking, most of that is run by cloud providers these days. And so uh, we work with that. We make sure those are clusters get updated, understand that part of things, um, but also handle all, handle all these add-ons that help our clients, again, turn Kubernetes from just a bunch of nodes out there into something that can really run their applications. And so, 
like I said earlier, we might have at any one time, 40 different add-ons that we're running for clients, anything from like service meshes to monitoring to things to handle DNS and ingresses and certificates and, you know, all these different things that go into making the cluster work for applications. Uh, so that's what we typically are responsible for. Um, customers are going to be responsible for things like, or our customers, CICD tools, making sure applications are deployed to the clusters, things like data storage, messaging and whatnot. And kind of in the middle, we'll, you know, where we kind of have shared responsibility, things like DNS, customer manages DNS strategy, we might manage DNS for the Kubernetes zones. And then as you bring applications in, um, you know, the add-ons that we have will say, look at an ingress object and say, okay, cool. Let's uh, create DNS records for this, get certificates set and make sure an ingress controller is aware of it, create rules for that. And so make sure that an application can then exist amongst the ecosystem of microservices and start to handle traffic. Um, monitoring, you know, our clients will often monitoring the workload, monitor the workloads that they're deploying, but they'll, we'll make sure that Kubernetes itself is monitored uh, worker nodes, control plane, and all those add-ons are working, or anything to do with our clients' workloads that may be symptomatic of an issue at the cluster. Like, you know, some things, uh, pods are pending, for example, which typically means there's no nodes available for a specific workload. We need to come in and help make sure that that isn't a cluster level issue. Um, so yeah, and we think this is a pretty good model and something that can be used as a template for other folks when setting up uh, you know, setting up their own team organization, or if they're, again, interested in working with somebody like us, this is where we sit in the stack. And um, we really like doing it. Cool. Uh, Dave, do you want to talk about this report? Sure. So one of the things that we'd offer everybody at the end of the session is if you're looking for more resources on um, on Kubernetes and how to get started and what to do about security, cost optimization and reliability. We'd offer our uh, benchmark report, which looks at um, I think hundreds or even thousands of workloads for a bunch of our customers and um, how we help them in various ways. Uh, let me just um, quickly put in the chat so you can grab, um, grab the link yourself. Oops. Benchmark. That should uh, take your the report. We're going to send a copy of it to everybody that um, has attended today. And the other thing that we'd offer is if you are looking for some help um, in managing Kubernetes or getting started or you know anything related to the things that we talked about today, and we welcome you to contact us. I'm going to put a um, quick link to our contact us form, and we'll also um, share that in a follow up email. So Brian or Ryan, do you have any final comments to share? Uh, no, I think I've said enough. <laughs> I think I've talked quite a bit, uh, but <laughs> yeah. I, we I would a, say, yeah. If it, if, I was going to say, if anybody has a question, you know, it's a good time to um, put it in the Q&A toward the bottom. I guess one thing that I would always ask is, Brian, Ryan, what's the best way to get started if somebody's looking for help? Uh, great question. Um, you mean help getting started with Kubernetes or just getting, needing help with some of these topics or... I guess either one would be a good good place to start. Sure. Getting started, sure. let's say. Yeah, let's, I mean, with Kubernetes, one of the nice things with um, the managed cloud providers is that it's very easy to get up there and press a couple buttons and get a uh, cluster started. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily do that long-term. We push button infrastructure isn't a great thing. Uh, I don't think we touched on infrastructure as code, but again, we use Terraform all the time for things and something like that is certainly the best uh, it, yeah, you want to make sure all of your stuff's in code and easily, easily auditable, versionable, um, all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, if you just want to get started, you know, there's very simple ways to do that through, uh, cloud providers, give it a shot, find some, you know, basic workloads online that you can deploy like a simple hello world application. We use something called basic demo for our tests. Uh, it's an, I think our incubator helm chart. 
uh, that just gets something running very quickly that you can then you know hit the endpoint of and start playing with. Uh, yeah, and then start digging in through there. Um, any of these other things, again, the internet's full of stuff, uh, but I think you're, you know, folks are also always welcome to, you know, check in with us if they have any questions about specific things. Uh, we also have a bunch of open source tools. Um, looks like we do have a question. Oh, okay. Somebody would like, uh, Dave, it looks like somebody wants to see if a recording of this would be uh, valuable. Yep, or absolutely. Available. We'll definitely, we'll definitely be sharing a copy of the recording um, probably by the end of the day today. Cool. All right. Uh, Ryan, anything you want to add to people getting started? Um, yeah, just uh, along with what you were saying about, you know, the, the big cloud providers. Um, I know off the top of my head, EKS actually has a pretty, or Amazon AWS has a pretty great guide on using Terraform to get started with uh, setting up an EKS cluster. And it also, uh, thankfully, stays within their free tier. So, you're not gonna break the bank messing around with it there. Um, but also if it's something as a developer or for your developers that you would like them to start looking at without setting up any cloud infrastructure. There's really cool projects where you can run Kubernetes clusters um, right on your machine. Uh, I think the big one nowadays is Kind, which is Kubernetes in Docker, um, just spins up a, you know two commands you can have a cluster spun up and configured to use um, locally. Um, then even here, I think uh, testing updates and, and things like that quickly, um, that's one of the tools we reach for. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, getting developers uh, a little bit more comfortable using Kubernetes something like, with something like that, um, if they're interested in that is, is fantastic. Um, you know, otherwise, I think Ryan mentioned this at the beginning, you know, they may just <clears throat> be used to running things on Docker Compose locally, <clears throat> which is great. But again, um, making sure that translates into a Kubernetes context, that's a bit trickier. So if folks are interested or keen, you can use things like that. Another cool tool is called Telepresence, which can do a couple of things like either run um, kind of like a proxy to proxy services from the cluster locally. So if you're trying to uh, develop locally and make sure things work within Kubernetes, uh, external Kubernetes cluster, you can use that to make that work or for other types of testing. Again, this is getting a little bit more advanced. You want to make in for folks that are already comfortable using Kubernetes, but it's a cool way to tie that into um, folks local development. All right, sounds good. So at this time, I don't see any further questions. Um... Ryan, Ryan, thank you very much for your time today. And I think we'll conclude the session. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks Dave, cool. for helping us put this on. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Yeah, thank you very much.